My name's Aram Kim. I'm a second year PhD candidate specializing in New Testament here at the Faculty of Divinity in the University of Cambridge. Uh, in this video, I'll be talking a bit about my academic journey in getting to this point and then explore a bit about uncertainty, belief, and how the intangible can be studied academically, and then finish with what it would be like to study theology, philosophy, or religion at university. So beginning with my academic journey, uh, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm an American. Technically, I was born in Seoul, South Korea, but just a couple of months after I was born, my parents immigrated to the U.S., where I grew up mostly in the Northeast, in the state of Connecticut. And Connecticut is actually where I did my undergraduate study at uh, Yale University. Now, my journey may be of interest to some of you um, because I took a bit of a roundabout uh, journey in my academic journey. I was interested in a lot of different things and maybe you too are thinking, well, you know, I'm not really sure what to study at university because I have a lot of different interests. And so if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you do have some interest in theology, philosophy, and religion. Um, but uh, just as a little encouragement, don't be too discouraged if you are interested in multiple areas of study and you might be pleased to hear that it can be actually helpful to your research if you choose to study um, in the Faculty of Divinity. So for my undergraduate study, I majored in anthropology at Yale University. But to be honest, before I majored in it, I wasn't quite sure what anthropology was. Uh, so the way I figured out my major was actually by looking at every single major that was offered at Yale University. And the reason why I chose anthropology was because it was the only major where I wanted to take almost every single class. And so um, if you aren't familiar with anthropology, it's actually the study of humans or the study of uh, people. Um, anthropos meaning human in Greek. Uh, there was different kinds of anthropology uh, that we had to study. There was linguistic anthropology and political anthropology, uh, kind of archaeological anthropology or physical anthropology, uh, which is where a lot of the kind of bones and monkeys and dinosaurs sort of come in. But I was particularly interested in socio-cultural anthropology and especially in the way media and images shape the culture. And you'll be able to see that later on when I talk about kind of my own personal research and how that came into play. So for a while, um, after my undergraduate degree, I actually worked in media and specifically cinematography in California before I realized I really couldn't ignore my sense of calling and, and passion towards studying theology. And so I actually ended up getting a Master of Divinity, or MDiv degree as it's sometimes called, at uh, Torch Trinity Graduate University in Seoul, South Korea, which was really great because I loved the international community and I met people there that I wouldn't have been able to meet uh, even if I had gone to a very international type school in the US, even despite the diverse communities that are in the United States. Um, Th this school in Korea, which was taught in English, um, was just uh, a great uh, amalgamation of just amazing people. And so I loved my study there and I thought, great, after this three-year MDiv degree, I'll be done and um, I can just move on. Uh, uh, but I, in my third year, many professors started coming up to me individually and were asking me if I was considering getting a PhD in theology and I thought absolutely not. Um, I wasn't super keen on studying more. I thought I'm done, sorted, moving on. Uh, but <laughs> one professor kind of insisted and came up to me and said, you know, you really should consider it. You know, it's an immense privilege to study theology and if you can, you know, have the opportunity to do a PhD, why wouldn't you take that? So I decided that my professor was right and I decided to go for the academic route. I applied to a couple of different schools, including the University of Cambridge, because uh, some people had recommended it, and I met some really lovely folks at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference, and all the Cambridge people were really welcoming and, and helpful and encouraging, 
And so um, I applied and initially I applied to the MPhil because I felt like I needed a little bit extra um, academic um, research background before going straight into my PhD. And I was really lucky enough to study under a great supervisor um, throughout my MPhil and now my PhD. And I had decided to focus on the New Testament because those were kind of my favorite texts um, out of biblical literature. And, and funnily enough, my anthropology background and my media background was actually very helpful to my theological studies. Um, it helped focus my research and it also gave me an eye for understanding the way people perceived images and also understanding culture and how um, that can be applied and affected and affect and influence um, theology. And my multicultural background and my multilingual background, having studied other languages, um, was really helpful in understanding the background of different uh, cultures in the Greco-Roman culture of the first century, which is kind of my specialization. So I'm actually really glad for the way uh, my academic journey has been a bit roundabout and not exactly direct. And so that's my encouragement to you that if you are interested in different things, um, don't be afraid to let those incorporate and affect and actually help your research. Uh, when going into theology, philosophy, and religion. So why do people study theology, philosophy, and religion? Well, I would say that it all centers around the issue of belief. I think belief is fundamental to, fundamental to humanity because throughout all of history, people have always believed in something, whether that be God or how the world works or what drives them to live each day. All people from the beginning of time have had a set of beliefs that shape their perspective on their identity and their world, which in turn affects their actions and their interactions. What people say, what people do, it's all in relation to their beliefs. So if, for example, a person adopts some Epicurean philosophy and believes that there is no soul after death, and therefore no divine punishment, then they might think, oh, you only live once and then they can do whatever they can to enjoy life to the fullest. Or if a person has more animistic beliefs and they think there are multiple spiritual entities that influence every aspect of life, then they might have shrines in their homes or and be more mindful and careful in their everyday actions. Belief can be extremely powerful Millions of people have been killed over their beliefs. Entire wars, mass genocide has been committed over the conviction of a single belief. The belief that a people group was somehow less than, as seen, for example, in the Holocaust, could lead to a mass genocide. Or, as seen in British history, the belief over whether one should be Catholic or Protestant could lead to war and even death. What I find so intriguing about our beliefs is that many of them are formed out of a dynamic relationship between the seen and the unseen. Humans naturally seem to make observations about the world and then they try to explain them and understand them, which in turn forms belief. So for example, before Galileo and Newton, we didn't really know much about gravity or the fact that the world was round and that was hardly 500 years ago. The world seemed flat, it looked flat, and so we just assumed that it was, based on what we saw. And for centuries, our belief was that the world was flat and we would never have guessed that in fact, the world is not flat, but round, and that we're not flying off of this very quickly spinning globe because of this unseen force known as gravity. And it may sound weird for us to say that we believe that the world is round and we believe that there is gravity, um, having seen it from a scientific and mathematical perspective, um, but it is something to think about. It's, it's based on something that we've seen and something that, that is unseen. 
The dynamics of seen and unseen understandably applies beyond physics and astronomy to theology, philosophy, and religion. And in fact, the sciences and theology and philosophy, as you may know, were historically often intertwined. Philosophers of the past and present might try to explain their beliefs about, for example, uh, love, the concept of love. Certainly that's a challenge because love isn't something that's readily tangible or visible. But the expressions of love, like a hug or a kiss or even a love letter, might be experienced and so people can believe that love exists in a relationship. So once again, we see that theology and philosophy is really interesting because there's this, there's this grounding of belief and experience of the seen and unseen. Different perspectives on love alone are enough to write volumes and volumes about it, and indeed there are an inordinate amount of people and volumes and volumes of texts from all sorts of philosophers that we have to try to explain the concept of love. What about theologies and religions? There are so many writers of different theologies and religions who have tried to define belief in a god or belief in the divine, which uh, we usually think of as invisible, the spiritual, invisible divine beings. But divine beings can also be experienced in a similar way through a spiritual encounter, or they might be seen through an image or a statue. Even people who don't believe in anything spiritual want to talk about it and write about it because they have a strong belief that this unseen being doesn't exist. And so that's why we see, you know, atheists, for example, who are very interested in studying theology, philosophy, and religion. These seen and unseen aspects of belief are what has been intriguing to humanity in every generation. And so I think that's one of the reasons why there have always been people who have desired to read and write about the beliefs of theology, philosophy, and religion. They want to know and understand what people believe and why they believe it. A second intriguing aspect of theology, philosophy, and religion rises to the surface when we compare the various beliefs in different cultures and across different generations. For example, I find it really interesting that many different cultures throughout history have a solar deity or a god that represents the sun for example, the Aztec, Mayan, Chinese, Hindu, Celtic, Greek, Egyptian, and Zulu cultures, just to name a few, all have a sun god. And in a way this makes sense, right? Because the sun is this unexplainable, de uh, daily occurring entity in the sky that was vital to everyday life. But again, just prior to a few centuries ago, we really didn't know much about the sun ourselves. We didn't know what it was, how it worked. Even now, we still don't know everything about it because none of us can actually go there and physically touch it and investigate it. We have some instruments, but um, we can't go very close to the sun. And we can't even say for sure how the sun got there in the first place. And so it's almost understandable that historically many cultures have associated the sun with a powerful god because they see this observation, they see this entity, and they don't really know how to explain it, and they have a belief that develops surrounding it. And so they believe that there is a god, a sun god, attached to this entity, and they worship it because they know that the sun is an important part of life and they need the sun to survive. And even though people today may have a more scientific understanding of the sun, there are actually still cultures and people today and religions that continue to assign divinity and spirituality to the sun and associate it with a god. Another common deity that I found fascinating was uh, the fact that there's a fertility goddess across multiple cultures. We see iterations of it in Incan culture, Inuit, Arabian, Iranian, Japanese, Slavic, and Hawaiian culture. And once again, not limited to history, you can still see illusions of the goddess even today. In some cultures, they continue to worship a fertility goddess. 
But even in pop culture, you can see that the singer Beyonce, for example, uh, referenced a fertility goddess from the African Yoruba culture when she was pregnant and performing at the 2017 Grammy Awards. Like the commonality of the sun god, the prevalence of the fertility goddess in various cultures seems to make sense in that she's valued because she might help a woman become pregnant and have children, and a lack of children might suggest that the goddess is angry and must be appeased in some way if the family wants to have children. But there might be more to talk about here philosophically, theologically, in anthropology, especially when one notices that many of the fertility goddesses appear to be physically similar as well. So you can really start to see that my anthropology and media background is really flaring up here, and that you can see what fascinates me and motivates me in my studies. And so for people who really like to make these kind of cultural observations and notice the ways in which different cultures and religions have responded or interacted with their deities, um, theology, philosophy, and religion is an ideal subject area for them. So that's just another po potential example of the way in which uh, people study religion, theology, and philosophy and why they might be interested when they compare different cultures across multiple generations, not only in their similarities, but of course also in their differences. So a final point I wanna make about belief is that everything we believe is based on evidence. Some of it may not be very reliable evidence or some of it might be based on something qu quite irrational, uh, but everything we believe usually comes from something or comes from somewhere. And oftentimes we think of evidence as exclusively kind of a scientific uh, way of methodology. But actually this method of collecting and analyzing evidence can be applied to theology, philosophy, and religion as well. So I hope you'll allow me to uh, insert a little bit of my own specific research that I've done and you'll get a sense of how I analyze material by looking into material culture and uh, Greek literature to really s answer some of the questions that I had about Nike, the victory goddess in Greco-Roman culture, and how that related to uh, my studies in the New Testament. Hi everyone, my name's Aram Kim. I'm a second year PhD student at University of Cambridge. And I'm actually a One John scholar, and how I fell into the world of looking at Nike, the victory goddess, is that um, in One John five four, the only is the only place where we see the word Nike in Greek, um, victory, and it's equated with our faith, and uh, and I started to really look into the kind of Greco-Roman context surrounding that and was really intrigued to kind of see that there was this goddess Nike. Um, but it was interesting because I hadn't really heard of her and didn't know much about her. And so, and the more I looked into her, the more I was surprised to see her prevalence not only in material culture, and she's mentioned across several centuries um, of Greco-Roman literature, and then exists today with, with quite a lot of prevalence. And so, yeah, so that's what I was looking into and was really starting to ponder what is the necessity of this goddess? Why does she exist across so many centuries and even until today? And so if we look at Nike in the modern world, I was actually walking uh, with my brother in the middle of San Francisco where he works. And I was, I was intrigued to see that in the middle of San Francisco in California, there is this Greek goddess Nike. Um, the Roman equivalent being Victoria, atop this 79-foot pedestal. And she's got a trident in her left hand, uh, symbolizing naval success in war. And then in her right, she's holding a laurel crown, symbolizing triumphant victory. Now this is the Dewey Monument, uh, celebrating the 1898 victory of the Spanish-American War. And so I was really surprised to see that this goddess that I was studying was existing here in the middle of San Francisco. And then I noticed that in downtown Mexico City, an even larger Nike uh, is overlooking bustling traffic there as part of the Monumento a la Independencia, which was built in 1910 to commemorate the centennial of the beginning of Mexico's War of Independence. She's atop this 118-foot column 
and she's this massive 22-foot bronze statue covered in 24 karat gold. Like her counterpart in San Francisco, she's carrying a laurel crown in her right hand, and in her left, she holds a broken chain signifying the freedom found through war. Uh, we see other Nikes in Canada, England, Germany, India, China, and then of course, every Summer Olympics uh, medalist since 1896 has actually had Nike around their necks. She's on the medals of all of these Summer Olympics winners. We see Nike as part of the athletics company and part of the iconography of Rolls-Royce. And so the question is why, what is it about this goddess that compels societies all over the world today to regard her image with such frequent commemorative significance? Well, the answer to that is actually found in the material culture and Greco-Roman literature that illuminate her importance. Uh, so the prominence of Nike, this victory goddess, uh, is really intriguing because she doesn't have any prominent mythology or distinct personality traits of her own but she's linked to other powerful deities. Her image and influence are displayed particularly in the context of Greco-Roman competition and conflict. The earliest mention that we have of her uh, appears to be in Hesiod's Theogony, where she's described to be the daughter of Pallas and Styx, and she's honored alongside uh, her sisters, Zelos, Kratos, and Bia. That's rivalry, supremacy, and force, respectively because they were siding with Zeus in the battle against the Titans. Nike is interesting because she's attached to all these powerful deities. Zeus, the god of thunder and lightning, surely has enough power of his own, but somehow this depiction of Nike taking his side shows the first glimpses of this goddess functioning as a portent, similar to fate or destiny. Nike is a warning to any enemies that they'll lose against those she favors, and she's a boost of confidence to those she's chosen. The extent of her significance is apparent because even the powerful Zeus wants Nike on his side. We see this association of Nike and Zeus as Pausanias notes the connection several centuries later in 2nd century CE. In description of Greece, Pausanias says that one of the most noteworthy sites in the port city of Piraeus is a bronze image of Zeus holding a figure of Nike. Well, you can imagine the impressive power that this conveys. This, this god is literally holding victory in his hand, and all who are looking at his image can see the significance that is placed on this victory goddess. Nike is like a seal of assurance that Zeus holds power and victory over his enemies. But she's not limited to the cult of Zeus. We also see that she's interacting with other deities of, of note and power, like Artemis, Ares, Athena. Interestingly, and kind of perhaps expectantly, they're all associated with violence and warfare. For example, the oldest extant sculpture of Nike shows her connection to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. The sculpture, believed to date as early as 570 BCE, was found in 1887 on the Greek island of Delos, in front of the Temple of Artemis. The inscription on the base of the sculpture attributes the work to Archermos, who appears to be one of the first to depict the winged Nike. The statue being found outside the Temple of Artemis shows that Nike was indeed closely affiliated with the huntress goddess, who was known as a death-bringing deity. The relationship between Artemis and Nike makes sense, because both goddesses are associated with fighting and subduing an enemy, often with death being the result of the violent victory. Given that Nike is affiliated with military battles, it's unsurprising that she also has a presence in the cult of Ares, the god of war. One Homeric hymn even calls Nike the daughter of Ares. The association of the two deities can be seen today in Switzerland, in which a series of 2nd century CE mosaics portray the days of the week. The mosaic for Tuesday displays a strong, muscular Ares, sitting with spear, helmet, and shield, and flanked on either side by the goddess uh, Nike, and then on the other side you see Phobos, the god of fear. The imagery is appropriate because the Latin name for Tuesday, Dies Martis, literally the day of Mars, is in honor of the war god Mars, which is the Roman equivalent of Ares. However, it's also a triumphant message to place Nike and Phobos alongside Ares in the mosaic. The image portrays a victorious Tuesday, 
one that inspires and conveys a sense of success over others who are warned to fear this victory. The mosaic in Switzerland is interesting for visitors today, but one of the most impressive displays of Nike in antiquity was probably the Nike housed in the Parthenon in Athens. The Athena Parthenos, a now lost gold and ivory sculpture, showed Nike's association with Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warfare. The immense statue was described by Pausanias. The statue of Athena is upright, with a tunic reaching to the feet, and on her breast the head of Medusa is worked in ivory. She holds a statue of victory, Nike, about four cubits high, and in the other hand a spear. At her feet lies a shield, and near the spear is a serpent. The statue of Athena was probably about 38 feet, with a six-foot Nike in her hand. As the patron goddess of the city of Athens, Athena was valued and honored for her protection, but the Athenians need to show that Nike was also on their side reveals her value. The towering figures undoubtedly left a lasting impression, and is yet another visual display of the good fortune and success that the culture placed with Nike. The Athena Parthenos did not survive in antiquity, but small replicas of the statue were part of the thriving trade. And a one meter version from 3rd century CE called the Varvakeion Athena remains in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. The smaller figures seem to act like good luck charms for individuals who desire good fortune, protection, and success in their homes and businesses. While observing the material culture of Nike, one might begin to wonder why this victory goddess is only a smaller figure in the hand of these quote-unquote greater gods. Nike seems to be like a divine sidekick rather than a powerful goddess of her own. But actually, her standing in the right hand of Zeus or Athena seems to emphasize her function as a portent of victory. Though Nike may not appear to have any active agency, her very presence is believed to make a defining difference. The importance of Nike's presence is particularly apparent in the ways in which both Roman generals and emperors perceived the goddess. In the biography of Roman consul Sulla, for example, Plutarch describes Nike's role during the First Mithridatic War. That's 1st century BCE. And it is said that about the time when Sulla was moving his ar armament from Italy, Mithridates, who was staying at Pergamum, was visited with many other portents from heaven and that a victory, Nike, with a crown in her hand, which the Pergamenians were lowering towards him by machinery of some sort, was broken to pieces just as she was about to touch his head. And the crown went tumbling from her hand to the ground in the midst of the theater, and was shattered, whereat the people shuddered, and Mithridates was greatly dejected, although at that time his affairs were prospering beyond his hopes. Sulla had been assigned to quell insurgents like Mithridates VI of Pontus, and although Mithridates had a strong army, the support of many locals, and substantial riches to sustain his cause, his soldiers shuddered and lost all hope because of the portent from Nike. Mithridates was completely despondent and he lost the war. They all believed that the Romans would retain their power because Nike had indicated that Mithridates did not have her favor. Mithridates believed in Nike's power and so did Sulla. Sulla was a strong military leader, but he did not subscribe his successes simply to his abilities. When he later won the Battle of Chaeronia in 86 BCE against Mithridates' general, Archelaus, Sulla inscribed Nike's name on his trophies because he believed that his success in the war was due in large part to her favor rather than to military skill and strength. When Julius Caesar came into power, he similarly acknowledged Nike as the reason for his victories. According to Plutarch and Dio Cassius, Nike played a significant role during the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BCE, when Caesar had an unlikely win against Pompey the Great. Caesar was in the weaker position with fewer soldiers and limited provisions, but in the temple of Nike at Tralis, a palm tree was said to have shot up at the base of Caesar's statue. The palm tree appearing in Nike's temple was a sign that Caesar would win the battle, and indeed he did. In Dio Cassius's account, the goddess even turned toward the image of Caesar, indicating his impending victory. The sign from Nike served as the explanation as to how Caesar could have succeeded when by all appearances he would presumably have lost. Dio Cassius writes that Caesar later placed a statue of Nike in the Senate House in the city of Rome to signify that it was because of Nike that he achieved his victories. Having been built in his father's honor, 
The Curia was a very significant place for Caesar. And the Roman leader placed a statue of Nike there because he attributed the goddess with his having won control of the Roman Republic. Despite putting much of his own effort and skill into these wars, Caesar regarded his victory as having come from Nike and through Nike, and so he felt the need to have the statue made and set up in her honor in his most valued place. Dio Cassius mentions that the Nike statue was still existing in his time, demonstrating that well into the second century CE, the visual reminder of this important victory in Greco-Roman history remained for all to see. When Augustus became emperor, he too was a victorious leader, but when things did not go his way, he was convinced that Nike must have favored the other side. Dio Cassius recounts that at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest in 9 CE, Germanic tribes decimated the Roman legions. Up until that point, Augustus had been a very successful emperor, annexing many regions and enlarging the Roman Empire. Yet his failure to secure the region of Germania left him fearful, that his enemies would come all the way to the city of Rome. The victory of his enemies, Augustus reasoned, was certainly related to Nike. It was said that her statue in Germany had turned around to come against Italy, and this portent was an indication that there were supernatural forces at work. Nike was not said to have been angry and thrown errors or cast down lightning. She herself was what made the difference between victory and defeat. Material culture and Greco-Roman literature reveal that Nike had a more significant role in antiquity than many may realize today. Despite the paucity of her defining characteristics, Nike was credited with historic victories owing to the belief that her favor was what allowed victory to occur. She defined the victor regardless of a person's skill or strength, and her choice affected the morale and subsequent behavior of those in the Greco-Roman world. Consequently, she was simultaneously feared and revered and statues were erected to both curry her favor and bestow her honor. Nike may not be venerated today as she once was, but the persistence of her image more than two millennia later indicates that there's something quite remarkable about what she represents. Nike provokes a message of success that is still deemed highly in the world today, and she inspires a necessary belief and confidence that a person can be victorious in the face of conflict. So as you can see, if you're more of a poetic and abstract theoretical philo philosophical thinker, you can of course still present your ideas in an abstract way. So I hope you're not put off by me saying that you have to have the, the I hope you're not put off by the idea that you have to be an analytical thinker and provide evidence uh, in what you're saying in kind of a scientific and analytical way. My point here is that the study of theology, philosophy, and religion isn't limited to some spiritual exercise, but it can actually be more similar than we think to scientific study in the sense that we can make claims based on evidence and observations. Studying theology, philosophy, and religion at university is really interesting because there's such a rich amalgamation of anthropology, history, culture, literature, politics, and even poetry that can interact with the topic. And so it can be specialized, focusing on a particular region or time period, or it can be comparative, seeing the similarities and differences between scholars or religious beliefs. Often, as does much in the humanities, it does involve knowing a bit of languages, and in my case I had to learn Greek, Latin, and some French and German, However, if you don't really want to focus on the linguistic aspects or if you're just not really great at languages, you don't really have to worry too much about that. Um, and you can just really hone in on what you would like to research and learn and write about. You know, theology and philosophy can seem antiquated to some people. They think, as one taxi driver once asked me, what are you going to do with a degree in theology? Um, but actually, uh, just like history, literature, and even science, as I mentioned, there is an investigative research process and skill that can go into studying even more abstract ideas. So you will learn to analyze various material and present the findings in a cohesive manner. But even beyond that, um, as you're studying beliefs about our world, you this perspective will shape who we are, what we do, and it can be applied to all areas, whether you want to go on to teach or write or even hold influential positions in society. 
I really enjoyed studying theology here at Cambridge because everyone I've met has been really collaborative and supportive and I think the nature of the subject area does lend itself to talking through one's ideas and hearing about what others might also have to say on the topic. So if you have some specific or even broad interest in studying theology, philosophy, or religion, I would encourage you to consider it. Uh, continue reading, writing, and talking to people about it, and enjoy the process of delving into people's beliefs and ideas.